Well, good morning. I'm very excited to be here today. We are in our second week of a series called Who Cares? And today we're going to talk about caring for your neighbor. And last week, Pastor Dennis kicked off this series, and he shared a few ideas that I think really pertain both today and in the next weeks as we talk about caring for the world. Um, But I wanted to revisit that for maybe some of you that didn't hear it, but also as we set kind of the foundation for today. And the first thing that and Pastor Dennis shared that I think is so important, is that we need to make a shift from caring about to caring for. He used this idea, he said that in the the Euro Cup in, in Europe, a soccer competition that's going on right now in this tournament, there was a soccer player who had a heart attack. And as Pastor Dennis heard about this, he felt something. He thought something. He actually cared about this man, this soccer player, who had fallen down on the pitch. That's the soccer field. But he didn't hop in his car, drive down to the airport, book an air flight, fly to Europe, and go care for this man. Think often we can care about things, but not necessarily care for. We can care about people, but not necessarily care for them. And that's really going to be the premise of what I talk about today is how we can make that shift from taking something from our mind and and our heart and and allowing it to be our action. We just sang about being the hands and the feet of God and caring for our neighbors is about that. And then he shared an idea that I absolutely love is that we should love other people when we feel like it. I was like, that's great. When I'm in the mood, when someone's treating me nice, I'm going to go love people. I thought, I can absolutely do it. But then he followed it up and he said, and love people when you don't feel like it. And again, as we talk about today's message of caring for our neighbors, sometimes it'll be when we feel like it. And other times it'll be when we don't feel like it. And then he said, love other people and serve other people in ways that are natural, in ways that just come out of us, in those places where we're comfortable, in doing things that we like to do. And then he said, and serve people when it's difficult, in hard times. And that one's not quite as easy for some of us. But I wanted to revisit all that because I really think that that's the premise, that's the foundation of how we move forward. And that when we look at some words, love, serve, and care, they're interchangeable, they're synonymous. When when God tells us to love, he's telling us to serve, he's telling us to care. Today we're going to look at a story out of the book of Luke, and it's, it's called The Good Samaritan. And If you've been in the church at all, you've heard of the story of the Good Samaritan. And if today is the first day you've ever been in the church, you've heard Good Samaritan too. We hear news stories about a cat that climbs up a tree and a Good Samaritan neighbor climbs up after the cat and saves it. Or a Good Samaritan pulled over on the side of the road and helped someone when they needed their tire fixed or their car caught fire, which happened to me just this past week. We know the term Good Samaritan. But when we look at it here, we're going to look at what Jesus is is going through and the lessons that he wants. I really really want to encourage you to allow this story to, to penetrate your hearts, to allow yourself to be placed inside this story. And maybe you'd be in multiple different positions in this story, but but let's just see what God wants to do through this story for you. So Jesus is talking, and there's this expert in law. An expert in law basically is someone who knows the Old Testament, someone who grew up in in the Jewish faith, who knows what he's supposed to do. He studied it all. He's got it all memorized. He could tell you everything about the faith. And he's talking to Jesus, and he says, Hey, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Well, you know the word. What what does the law say? And here's what the man says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've read that passage. I've seen it on a screen. I've sung it in a song. But I think I often overlook some nuance to it. It says, love the Lord your God with 
everything that you are. I tried to come up with a picture of maybe what that would look like. And the best picture I got, and this isn't about me, it's about other people. I have some friends who are endurance athletes, who are really devoted endurance athletes. They do Ironman triathlons. They run 100 milers. And I get a picture of how they embrace this endeavor with everything they've got with their mind, with their heart, with their soul, with their strength. Like I'm talking their life revolves around it, right? I had a friend who was here at the Navy Postgraduate School getting his master's degree while he was training for an Ironman triathlon. Ironman triathlon, you swim over two miles, you ride your bicycle over 100 miles, and then you run a marathon after that. I mean, the training for this is intense, and he's doing it while getting his master's degree. So what did he do? Because he was doing it with all his mind, all his heart, all his strength, everything that he got. So he was up at 4 o'clock in the morning, running around La Mesa so that he could get his laps in in the morning. He was going to class and studying, and then getting a break, and then hopping on his bike and going to ride his bike all day long, filling his mouth full of food because he was burning 5,000 calories a day and had to eat. Getting to bed when he could at the right time so he could get back up the morning at 4 a.m. to start the whole thing over again. His life literally revolved around training for this Iron Man. If we are to love God with all that we are, our lives need to revolve around that concept. Like everything we do from when we wake up in the morning to when we go to bed at night should be about loving God. But he continues on here and the last part of that verse I want to revisit. And it says, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, I paused in the middle of there, but, but this man didn't pause in the middle of there. And God didn't pause in the middle of there to love God is to love him with everything we've got and to love our neighbor as ourself. This also is an an idea that's not just in the Christian church, but around the world. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. Do for others what you would have them do unto you. You know, I think we often think about it that way. To love our neighbors as ourselves is to love people the way we'd want to be loved. To treat other people the way we'd want to be treated. i got to tell you something, a little insight. I am a massive introvert. I don't want my neighbors coming to my house. I don't want them knocking on my door. That's not my natural tendency. So if I take this concept and I apply it to that, then I'm going to leave my neighbors alone. Right? I'm not going to bother them because I don't want to be bothered. But I don't actually think that's what he's saying. I truly believe that to love your neighbor as yourself is to love your neighbor the way you love yourself. It's to serve your neighbor the way you serve yourself. It's to care for your neighbor the way you care for yourself. And I think often in the church, we want to kind of sugarcoat things. I think we often want to make them seem not as serious. But the reality is that it is, is serious. This is a massive call on our lives. Like for me to say to you, you get dressed every morning. So who are you dressing? You're like, whoa, that's pretty harsh. That's like a big deal. You, you fed yourself this morning, so who are you feeding? I actually believe that's what God is saying. That to love your neighbor as yourself is to take the care that you give yourself, the attitude with which you care for yourself, the effort with which you care for yourself, and then expound that and expand that to the rest of the world. I'm going to continue on in in verse 28. And he says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Pretty much every time I have an opportunity to be in front of an audience of any kind, I refer to James 122. I think it's one of the most profound verses in all the Bible. And it says, do not just listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Jesus is telling this expert in the law of this right here. He's saying, yeah, you know, right? You, you know the law. You're an expert. I just asked you a question. I, I, quiz, I quizzed you. You answered it correctly. Now go and do it. 
I, I really believe that that's what God wants us to do. To not just hear a message, to not just hear some guidance, to not just hear some ideas and then put those in the memory bank, but to actually do what it says. So continuing on into verse 29, it says, but he wanted to justify, justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I think it's also very common for us, I know it is for me, to read something in the Bible and to go, man, that guy, can't believe he did that. Like he's talking to Jesus and he's trying to justify himself. What's, what kind of gall does this guy have? I can't believe he had the nerve to try to justify himself to Jesus. And then I put myself in the story. And I realize, oh, I try to justify myself all the time. So he's saying, who's my neighbor? Like, well, I don't see anybody around me. Like, I don't have people living next to me. Maybe for some of us, that's the thing. We're like, hey, I live out on Corral de Tierra, and I got a big driveway up to my house. I don't see my neighbors. I don't know who my neighbors are. We justify it. Maybe we say, I don't have enough time in my day to love other people, to care for my neighbor. We justify ourselves. I don't have a lot of resources. I don't have a lot of riches. I don't have stuff that I can give to other people. We try to justify ourselves. I don't have time. I'm too busy. Too much else is going on. We try to justify ourselves. So Jesus says, you know what? I'm not going to just leave it at that. He said, okay, this man wants to hear who his neighbor is. Let me share. So we're going to read about eight verses right now, and it's Luke 10, 30 through 37. This is the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells in response to, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. I want to point something out that I haven't noticed until this time in preparing for this. And that is that Jesus, or I'm sorry, that the expert in the law said, and who is my neighbor? Jesus tells this story, and then at the end, he asks a question. And he asks the question, who was a neighbor to this man? I think so often we try to identify those people out in our world that maybe could qualify as our neighbor when I believe Jesus is saying it's not about them, it's about us. That the call on us as we read the story of the Good Samaritan is how can we be neighbors? How can we have eyes of a neighbor, hearts of a neighbor, a mindset of a neighbor? But by looking at his story and what the Good Samaritan did, we can take some truths out of that, that that apply to our lives today. I think we can look at some of the things that he did and we can apply them to us today. And I want to say it's not coincidental that Jesus had a Samaritan be the one who actually stopped and made a difference. Like he may have been picking on the religious by talking about a priest and a Levite and saying, hey, these are guys that, that know the law kind of like you know the law. And then there's this other guy who really shouldn't be stopping. 
You know, at the very least, the Samaritan would have avoided the Jewish man who was beaten. At the most, he would have considered him an enemy. But at no point naturally would he have decided, hey, I should stop. Jesus is saying that, sure, we should love people and serve people in natural ways. We should love and serve people when it's easy. But we should love and serve people when it's not natural and when it's not easy. And you see, the Samaritan man, the first thing he did was he made himself available. The other two didn't make themselves available. In fact, they avoided the situation. And I think for each of us to really live out this life of caring for our neighbors, we need to make ourselves available. Several years ago, Sherry Harney shared this idea of rolling out of bed onto her knees and starting the day in prayer. I believe the reason was because her back hurt, and that was the only way she could get out of bed. But I started doing it, and I got to tell you that when I rolled out of bed and onto my knees and started my day in prayer, asking God to show me how he wants to use me that day, asking him to open my eyes to opportunities to be a neighbor, opportunities arose. They were there all the time. Truth is that I've really gotten out of that habit. I have done it a couple times in recent days in preparation for this. I had planned on doing it every day so I could get up here and tell you that, but I, but I didn't. But I gotta say, if you start your day in prayer, asking God to use you, asking God to show you how he wants to use you, I promise you, he's gonna provide opportunities. And the second thing the Samaritan did was he took action. He saw a need, he made himself available, and then he did something about it. He went to the man. He cleaned out his wounds. He poured oil on them, and he bandaged them. You see, when we see needs around us, when we become aware of opportunities to serve, we then need to do something about it. An important thing, I think, to look at from the life of this Samaritan is that he also didn't just do the minimum. And what I mean by that is I believe that God would be pleased if we were in that situation and we saw a guy who was beaten on the side of the road and we had pity on him and we went over there and we cleaned up his wounds and we put oil on them and we bandaged them up, I think God would say, all right, you made yourself available, you took action, you made a difference. You see, this man didn't stop there. He took it a step further and then a step further. That he didn't do the minimum required to care for someone, but he did so much more. I mean, he put, he put this man on his donkey so that he would walk alongside. He gave financially in coming up with a, an inn room for him to stay at. He offered as well to give financially in, in another way to, to pay for any added expenses. He went from making himself available to taking action, to giving of himself and sacrificing, to giving financially. And I really believe that God wants to use us in the same way. If we just hear this word, we just hear this challenge, this encouragement, and then go about our days the same way as we've done before. I truly believe we're missing out on what God would have for us. So today we're talking about caring for your neighbor, so I wanted to look at the word neighbor in the original Greek that this was written in. And the original Greek word for neighbor is placeion. And one of the definitions, as with many words, there's multiple definitions, it says those who are nearby. So as we have our mentality, our thinking about who is our neighbor, it's those who we are near. And as we think about how can we be a neighbor, I think it's an important thing for us to try to identify those people who we are near. It may very well be those people who are in our neighborhood, who live in the house next to us. For some of us, it'll be our neighbor is the person that we work with, the person that we 
share a cubicle with or sit next to many days. A neighbor might be a parent of one of our children in, in school. Uh, a neighbor could be someone that we know through sports or other extracurricular activities. When we have an idea of who are we near as opposed to who is my neighbor, I think it opens up a whole lot more opportunities. When we're at the grocery store and we're in line next to someone, they are near. They're now our neighbor. Prior to the car starting on fire a couple days ago, I was at the tire store and I was getting new tires on that vehicle that caught on fire. Yeah, not the best purchase ever. But when I was there, as I said, I'm an introvert. I also love Jesus and I love people. But I'm sitting at this tire store waiting for my tires. They didn't get me in when my appointment was ready. An hour later, they still hadn't gotten my car in. And I found myself speaking to a woman the entire time that I was there. It's someone I know. She's from my kid's former school. But I found an opportunity in that moment while waiting for tires to get put on my car to be a neighbor. I got to share life with her. I got to talk about Jesus with her, and it was a really neat opportunity. I had to be there, had my eyes open, probably had to be preparing a sermon for me to see it, but I did. And I had an opportunity at the tire shop to be a neighbor to someone else. Another definition of placeion is those who we are able to meet. And the fact is that that opens it up to everybody we will ever encounter in our life. If we have an interaction with them, if we make eye contact with them, if we're next to the bus with them, if we're sitting down at the tire shop next to them, we have an opportunity to be a neighbor to them. I was kind of thinking of a framework of how we can go about caring for a neighbor. And I really thought of two different ways that we can care for our neighbors. We can care for our neighbors individually, meaning in our own efforts, by ourselves. Like if it's our practical neighbor that lives next door, we could offer to mow their lawn. We could have some baked goods and take them over to them. We could take in their trash cans when they're there. We as individuals can go and can care for our neighbors that way. We can talk to our neighbors and just ask them how they're doing. We can talk to our neighbors and we can offer to pray for them as they share with us something that's going on with them. Whether it be the neighbor next door or a neighbor in another setting. A couple of years ago, I was at pickup for uh, one of my children at their school. And I got to tell you that, that Jesus was not very prevalent uh, in this school. It wasn't a school that necessarily embraced the idea of Christianity. That from the, the school to the families that were there, there just wasn't a, a groundswell of love for Jesus. And I was speaking to one of the moms who is not a Christian. And she was sharing how she was having an issue with one of her actual next door neighbors. And that they were having lots of conflict. And in that moment, in front of the school, with all of the other parents there picking up their kids, I said, can I pray for you? And she said, yeah, that would be great. I said, no, no, I mean, like right now, can I pray for you? And she's like, uh, okay. And so I did. I prayed with her that moment in front of the school. It was very clear. We had our heads bowed. We weren't doing the eyes wide open thing. And I had people come to me after the fact and acknowledge it. Now, let me have a little disclaimer here. Please don't go pray with people so others will see you. Don't go serve someone so someone else will see you. But know that people do see you. That others will recognize what is going on. And that even though it was unintentional, I had the opportunity not only to minister, care for, love, and serve someone in that moment, but to encourage other people simply through my actions. You never know what God is going to do when you make yourself available, when you give of yourself. So as individuals, we can find opportunities to care for people. We can serve them. We can pray for them. We can give to them. There's so much that we can do. But a lot of the times, we can't necessarily do all of the caring on our own. Like we just don't have 
what it takes. And I'll give you a great example. My heart breaks for people who are involved in, in victims of human trafficking. It's, it's a horrible, horrible injustice in this world. And the truth is that me and my own abilities, my own eyes, I don't necessarily have a way to go out there and personally identify victims of human trafficking. I don't know that I could walk up and down the street and have any clue whatsoever who needs my help. But there's organizations all over the place. We have one here, right here locally, Set Free Monterey Bay. Now also another quick disclaimer. I could get up here and talk for an hour about organizations that you can get involved with. I can't name them all. You can absolutely go find them. You can talk to other people. You can search the internet. They're there. You can talk to me and I'll give you some more. But there's a few that just kind of hit me in the heart. Set Free Monterey Bay has what it takes. They're part of a greater organization. They're actually able to go out there and help people who are victims of human trafficking. I'm involved in an international um, organization as well, International Justice Mission, where they actually will go in and they will physically pull people out of areas where they're being held hostage. Now, I'm not sure that I have the physical and mental and emotional prowess to do that, but I can give to them financially to help finance what they do. Most of you probably know that a foster and adoption care is really close to my heart. That we adopted our son through the Kinship Center in Salinas. They're the ones who do trainings for foster care and adoption. They're the ones who, who do the social work to try to put families together. They're the ones who offer respite care and, and ongoing trainings. They, they make foster care and adoption happen here in Monterey County, among many other agencies and organizations. And it's an amazing, amazing organization. It's not Christ-based. It doesn't have a lot of Jesus there. But if the body of Christ got involved and, and sought out ways to care for neighbors through partnering with them, then Jesus would come alongside as well. CASA, court-appointed special advocates. Recently, I became more aware of this. Now, it's pretty big in the foster world. And that what this is is that people can sign up Get training, and they can actually be a voice for a child who's dealing with a court issue, dealing with a custody issue. And so when this child can't necessarily speak up for themselves, their CASA, their advocate, can do so. Can give guidance to the judge even who's making a decision about what's going to happen. This is also not a Christian organization, but as a Christian walks into this and gets involved, Jesus comes alongside them as well. Shelter Outreach Plus offers compassionate support and opportunities for, for self-sufficiency for, for those who are underhoused, who are, who are homeless, who are victims of domestic violence. They can identify people, they can identify needs, but they can use people to serve in that capacity. I give you some practical ideas about doing things individually and doing things with organizations. But I also think practically and spiritually there's a whole other idea, and it's found in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When we do this, when we seek out opportunities to make ourselves available, for the work that God wants to do, we do not do it alone. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God's Holy Spirit to go with us. And in whatever place we find ourselves, we are his witnesses. You will be my witnesses. And I love this verse and the idea that it's not in one place. It says in Jerusalem, which is kind of like what we talked about last week. And this week is Judea and Samaria, which is the local community and maybe some of the more difficult places for us to go. And then Pastor Sean will talk next week about to the ends of the earth. But if we want to care for our neighbors, which in doing so shows God we love him, 
right from the very beginning, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. My kids will often tell me that they love me and I often rebut them with, then show me by how you love your siblings. You love me? Show me by the way you love your mom. One of the ways for us to show God that we love him is how we love other people. The process is simple. Start your day with prayer. Praying for God to show you how he wants to use you. Pray for God to open up doors and and make opportunities available. Second thing is to partner with organizations that are out there. How about sharing what's going on? How I have this opportunity to be up here and to share with you some ideas about ways to care for others. But you have a voice as well. And you have places where you can talk to other people. And you can rally up other troops to join you in what you're doing. And then giving. Financially using your resources to serve others. To love others. To care for your neighbors. And then going putting your hands and your feet and your experience to use. We were reminded through song, we were reminded through a small devotional, and I think we were reminded through a a message that God wants us to seek justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with him. And when we do that, this world will be changed in very practical, short-term ways where people are being fed and people are being clothed and people are being rescued from trafficking. But even more important than all of that, as we're his witnesses, we get to bring Jesus into all of those environments. We get to bring Jesus into all of those lives. And prayerfully, hopefully, God willing, lives are changed not only here and now, but for eternity. It truly is a unique privilege that we have to be the hands and feet of God, to be his voice into this world and to make a difference. And if we make ourselves available, God will do amazing things, both in us and through us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, each time I am reminded how you want to use us, I uh, am blown away. You could do your work any way you wanted to, but you have chosen to do it through your people. And I pray that we truly would take this challenge, each of us, myself included, to go out and care for our neighbors. Not so much in identifying who they are, but us ourselves becoming a neighbor. So that each person we encounter, each person that we meet along the way, we would see as an opportunity to demonstrate your love to them. Please, please show us the way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I got a few words of uh, announcements before we, we leave here. And the first is, in celebration of Independence Day, 4th of July, out in our courtyard, we've got some ice cream treats out there. And so we've got some, uh, some cool pops and some ice cream sandwiches and things like that. We'd love to have you go out there, enjoy some ice cream, enjoy some fellowship, connecting with one another. Maybe today is the opportunity for you to share with other people areas in which they can care for their neighbors. This Wednesday, we have Night of Worship. It's going to be our first night of worship since the pandemic. That will be right back here in this room. And if you didn't notice on your way in, out in the courtyard, there's a big, big screen. And we're calling it the Jumbotron. Don't know if it's actually a Jumbotron or not. But anyway, it's nice. Thank you. And uh, we're going to also have it out there for people who want to be outside. Um, for this night of worship on a Wednesday. If you need prayer, we have our team up here that would love to pray for you. If you're online, just text uh, your prayer request to the number that is on there, and we've got people that are there for you. And if you're new to Shoreline, whether new as in today's your first day or you've just never done so, we would love to have you go by the Connection Center. They'd love to tell you more about Shoreline, how you can get involved, different ways to serve, how we can help you grow in your faith. And if you're at home, just text Um, welcome to the the phone number on your screen. And now, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to send you off with a a word of blessing and commissioning to send you off into this world. (sighs) 
I'm not going to ask, Lord God, that you send these people to truly be your hands and feet in this world. Would you open their eyes as you open mine to opportunities to be your voice in this world, to not only identify who our neighbors are, but to become a neighbor ourselves, so that each person we encounter, we see as your child and an opportunity for us to demonstrate your love to them. Please, please, love through these people as they go about their day to day and their week to come. We send them off in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.